Hi everyone, I'm Dan Fullerton, and today I'd like to talk about the conservation of energy. Our objectives are going to be to state and apply the relationship between work and mechanical energy, to analyze situations in which an object's mechanical energy is changed by external forces, to apply the conservation of energy to analyze the motion of objects, and finally to solve problems that call for application of both conservation of energy and Newton's laws of motion. So with that, let's dive in and talk about conservation of mechanical energy. We already know that if we consider a single conservative force doing work on a closed system, the work done by that conservative force is equal to the change in kinetic energy. That's the work energy theorem. And we also know that the work done by a conservative force is equal to the opposite of the change in an object's potential energy. So if we put those two together, if the work done by a conservative force is delta K and the work done by a conservative force is delta U, it shouldn't be much of a stretch to say that change in kinetic energy is equal to the opposite of the change in potential energy. Therefore, we could write this that the change in, in kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy equals zero. The sum of the kinetic and potential energies also known as the mechanical energy, is constant for a closed system. If there are only conservative forces, then the initial energy equals the final energy. Or you could write that as the initial kinetic energy plus the initial potential energy must equal the final kinetic energy plus the final potential energy. That's the law of conservation of mechanical energy. Now, if we we're dealing with non-conservative forces, they change the total mechanical energy of a system, but not the total energy of the system. Remember, energy can't be created nor destroyed. However, it can change the total mechanical energy. And typically how it does that is the work done by a non-conservative force is converted into internal energy or becomes the change in temperature of the object in the system. So the total energy is equal to the kinetic energy plus the potential energy plus any work done by non-conservative forces, while the mechanical energy is just equal to the kinetic plus the potential. Let's take a look at how we can apply some of these concepts of conservation of mechanical energy. First off, we have an object of mass m falling from a height h. So there's our object, it's going to fall from some height h. Find its speed immediately prior to impact using conservation of mechanical energy. And we're gonna neglect air resistance for this problem. Well, when we do this, we know that at the top of its path, right here, it has some initial kinetic and initial potential energy. And then right before it hits the ground as it's going through some height h, it must have some final kinetic energy and final potential energy. And what I'm going to do to simplify this is I'm going to set the, the potential energy point right here at the bottom, the gravitational potential energy equal to zero, because really what we're worried about is the change in potential energy. Once I do that, I can write that the kinetic energy initial plus the initial potential energy must equal the final kinetic energy plus the final potential energy. And I can do that because we're only dealing with conservative forces in this problem. The initial kinetic energy, if it's dropped from rest, is zero, plus its initial potential energy, mgh, the height at which it was raised to, must equal the final kinetic energy, one half mv squared, plus the final potential energy. And we're going to set that ground level right before it hits over here as our zero point of potential energy. Now, my masses, I can divide both sides by m, they make a ratio of one. So gh equals one half v squared, multiply both sides by two, and I get that v squared equals two gh, or velocity equals the square root of two gh, and plus or minus, but we'll let you deal with that. Compare that to what you would get if you did this through a kinematics approach. Should get the same thing. Let's take a look at another slightly more complex example that's a classic problem in physics. A roller coaster car begins over here at some height, h, above the ground, and it completes a loop along its path of radius r. 
in order for the car to remain on the track throughout the loop, what minimum value for h in terms of the radius of the loop r is required. Now we're going to assume frictionless in order to do this, but let's take a look at how we would do that. If that is one radius, then that must be another radius, so the height of the loop is 2r. Let's take a look. Let's start off over here at point A, and that will talk about the kinetic energy initial plus the initial potential energy over there. Let's also look over here where we're interested at the top of the loop. Let's call that our final kinetic energy plus our final potential energy. Well, when we do that, initially our kinetic energy is zero. It starts at rest, but its potential energy there must be mgh. That must be equal to our final kinetic plus our final potential. Let's call that one half m v final squared for our final kinetic energy at that point plus potential energy is going to be mg times the height 2r. All right, setting this point at the ground at height 0 equal to our potential energy of 0. Now it becomes an exercise in algebraic manipulation. This implies then as we look through this, first off, all of the m's are going to, we can divide all of these by m. Masses will make a ratio of 1. And if I multiply everything by 2 to get rid of that 1 half, on the left hand side I'm going to get 2gh equals vf squared plus 4gr. Or rearranging for v final squared, v final squared is equal to 2g times h minus 2r. Good so far? Let's take a look now and realize that for an object going around a circle, it must have some centripetal acceleration. v squared over r has to be its centripetal acceleration. For it to remain on the tracks, we know that v squared over r must be greater than or equal to the acceleration due to gravity. Otherwise, it's not going to remain on the track. Therefore, v squared must be greater than or equal to gr. Well, when we do this, we already know that v squared 2g h minus 2r, we can start to substitute in. v squared for 2g h minus 2r now tells us that 2g times the quantity h minus 2r must be greater than or equal to gr. Or, divide both sides by 2g, and I get that h minus 2r must be greater than or equal to r over 2. And if I want just h, add 2r to both sides, h must be greater than or equal to, well, 2r plus 1 half r is going to be 5r over 2. So there's our answer. In order for this to work, the initial starting height, h, must be greater than or equal to 5 halves or 2.5 times whatever that radius, assuming it's frictionless. If we pull friction into the equation, h is going to have to be even higher than that. A classic problem where we're using conservation of energy to solve for some, uh, for some givens. All right. Hopefully that gets you started with conservation of energy. If you need more help or looking for assistance, check out aplusphysics.com. Thanks and make it a terrific day.